Good afternoon. <clears throat> it is 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, uh, April the 27th, 2021. We are to welcome you to the Dallas Independent School District STEM Environmental Education Center virtual field trip. Teachers, if you're watching and you have not signed up, please do so. Go to www.towny.cc slash EEC register and sign up. This is just for our attendance records. Thank you. Uh, the program today will be interdependence among living systems. During this virtual field trip, students will investigate how organisms and populations in an ecosystem depend on and may compete for biotic factors. Explore how short and long-term environmental changes affect organisms and traits in subsequent populations and recognize human dependence on ocean systems and explain how human activities such as runoff, artificial reefs, or use of resources have modified these systems. Ms. Ramirez will tell you about animals competing for resources. Ms. Nash will discuss plants competing for resources. Mr. Monroe will tell you all about environmental changes. And Ms. Fuller about human dependence on ocean systems. And we'll have a special guest uh, speaker um, talking about estuary systems of Texas. Uh, during this program, you cannot ask us verbal questions, but you can go to www.tiny.cc slash EEC space question space answer and send us in a question containing to the program and I'll do my best to answer them during the program. If not, I'll send the answers to your teacher. Now I'm going to stop sharing my screen and Ms. Sarah Ramirez is going to tell you all about animals competing for resources. Hello, my name is Ms. Ramirez, and in this segment, we're going to be learning about how animals compete for resources. So before we start our presentation, I have a couple of animal friends I'm going to show you guys. My first one is a Madagascar hissing cockroach, and they get that name because they are from the island of Madagascar, um, but also the name hissing because they make a loud hissing sound when they feel scared or threatened. Uh, now, these guys, uh, when they are competing for territory or for a mate, um, or even for hierarchy, uh, they will actually use those big bumps or those horns that you see on the top, they will actually use those to fight each other uh, for those resources. So these are pretty cool. And that's a Madagascar hissing cockroach. Another animal that I have for you guys is a bearded dragon. His name is Spike. And Spike here gets the name bearded dragon because they have a pouch of skin underneath their chin. When they get scared or um, upset or frustrated, uh, they will actually inflate that beard to make themselves look big and scary. Now, males actually tend to be very uh, territorial, and so they will uh, kind of lunge at each other or fight for each other or fight with each other um, for, again, that social hierarchy thing or for territory. Uh, so that is Spike. So I'm going to go ahead and put him up. Now we're going to start our presentation really quick, and we'll take a look at some other examples of competition. So I'm gonna share my screen and I have a couple of essential questions for you guys. So hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll be able to answer these two questions. The first question is, why does competition occur among animals? And the second question is, you should be able to give an example of, how an, of an animal and how it depends on biotic and abiotic factors. Uh, so some quick examples of competition among people. Uh, one of my favorite things is I love shopping on Black Friday. Um, so of course, people are competing to get those products that are on sale. Uh, but also think about in your own life when you were a kid, um, if you go to a birthday party and you were you know, hitting the pinata and everyone was rushing toward to get the candy. Um, or think about Easter, uh, which was celebrated back in April. Um, kids racing to get the Easter eggs. Uh, people are competing for those things because there are limited resources. A great example uh, due to the COVID pandemic last year was that run on toilet paper. Uh, we saw that the shelves were empty, so people were competing with each other to get those uh, resources. So again, competition is just when two or more animals uh, try and get the same thing. Um, and try and think of instances where you have had to compete for something. And again, we know that competition occurs because resources are limited. And here's a good example with my dog, Abby. 
uh, she took all three bones. So I actually have two dogs and she is very treat related. So she steals those bones from my other dog. And so now she hoards them. So shame on her. Uh, so again, we know that animals compete because resources are limited. And some resources that animals are competing for, we already mentioned uh, mates and for food, uh, but they can also uh, compete for things like space, uh, light, shelter. We mentioned that social hierarchy uh, with the, the hissing cockroaches. So those are all things that animals can compete for. Now of that list, can you see if you can identify which resources might be biotic or living resources and then what resources might be abiotic or non-living resources? Uh, so again, we know that the biotic resources that they're competing for would be things like mates, but also their living food sources, especially if they're a predator. And then here's just a couple of little examples of animals competing, whether they're fighting another animal for a mate or fighting for food resources. Uh, birds have very interesting examples of competition. This is a special type of bird called a bird of paradise. Um, and it has a cool little courtship dance. Uh, but if it doesn't dance just right, uh, the female will reject it. And then here's another type of bird. Um, it's called a widow jumping bird and the males actually go into a jumping competition and the female will actually choose the bird that can jump the highest for the longest amount of time. Uh, so again, birds have some very interesting competition among themselves. Now there are two types of competition. The first type is direct competition and that is when two or more organisms actually make contact with each other. Uh, so if we look example here with our Madagascar hissing cockroaches, this is direct competition because it's two organisms in contact with each other. They're pushing each other, uh, fighting for that space. Now this would be an example of intraspecific competition because it's the, within the same species. So it's two Madagascar hissing cockroaches. The other type of competition is indirect. And that is simply when organisms uh, use the same resource, but they may never see or interact with each other. Uh, so for example, uh, the deer and uh, feral hogs that we have out here, they are in indirect competition with each other out here in our post oak preserve. They may never see each other or run across each other, but they're actually competing for the same resources and that is food. So both of those organisms like to eat things like acorns. Um, and so they are in, they're in competition with each other for that same food source. Now, this would be an example of inter-specific competition because it's between two different species, the deer and the hog. So see if you can think of some examples of direct competition and indirect competition. And then I have a quick challenge for you guys. Research an interesting example of competition and its associated behavior. And so I was interested, I found it curious that two of the animals that I thought were the cutest, they actually can be super aggressive. Uh, so here we have some penguins fighting and these rabbits that are fighting. Uh, so think about why are these animals fighting and what are they competing for? Another interesting example would be the blue mannequin birds. Uh, these pretty ones are all the males and they line up in a nice little line and do their little dance for the female. And then uh, the female would choose which one she liked the best. Now this was a funny little segment on uh, planet earth because the female actually rejected all of them and then she went away. So those are all interesting examples of competition. And then here's a little example of our of bearded dragons um, that are fighting against territorial reasons as well. So I'm gonna stop my screen share and that's all I have for you guys on competition. We're gonna give it back to Dr. Worman to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Maris. And a question came in. Tell us about competition between animals competing for resources. Interspecific competition occurs when members of more than one species compete for the same resource. Woodpeckers and squirrels often compete for nesting rights in the same hole and spaces in trees. I uh, wish you could see this picture that I found recently. It uh, shows a woodpecker and a squirrel confronting each other. And I believe that squirrel might need to leave because that woodpecker is serious about protecting her home. And now, Ms. Nash is going to tell you about plants competing for resources. 
Hello, welcome to my classroom. And today we're talking about how plants compete. And you might not think about plants competing with each other because they're not fighting like those cockroaches. That's pretty cool. And the males are the ones that have those little projections on the on top of them. So plants, how do they compete? What do they need? What, what do they have to compete over? They need sunlight and air and water. And of course, the air is kind of everywhere. They get their carbon dioxide, they give off their oxygen. But water and sunlight and nutrients are the things that they're competing over. Okay? There may not be enough for everybody. So let's look at a few pictures and um, see what we can find out. There we go. Well, let's see. Do we have a picture? There we go. Okay. So sunlight. So it's a really important thing for plants. A big thing. It's how they do photosynthesis, made with light. So they can grow taller than the other plants. And you can see this in your garden or out in the forest. You can see that some plants, some trees have gotten up to the top to the canopy. They're getting all the sunlight. Other plants are trying to get there or waiting for one of the big ones to fall to open up the space in the canopy. So that's one thing is to grow faster and taller than your neighbors to get the sun. Other plants can just grow wider, like do gigantic leaves, okay, and you know, it's underneath, nobody else can grow. They've got all the sun. These gigantic lily pads, a child can sit on these, they're gigantic. They're shading out all the other plants that might be trying to grow underneath. And then another really interesting way of doing that is just to grow over your competition, like this kudzu vine has just smothered the competition. And they're getting all the sunlight in that tree that was there, out of luck. So plants also compete by being the most inedible. So if nobody wants to eat you, then you win, okay? Versus somebody that got eaten, okay? So one way to protect yourself is like cactus with these spines, okay? Or like just agave, with your sharp points on the end and this, this, this serrated edge here. Okay, on the, the leaf. Another way to protect yourself from being eaten and thereby win is by being poisonous. Okay, so this oleander, and you may see these, um, they're widely planted in South Texas, especially um, along the roadside. They're very beautiful, drought tolerant, but <clears throat> they are very, very poisonous. And every, uh, every so often somebody thinks, oh, I can use that lovely, straight stick of the oleander and roast a hot dog or a marshmallow and oops, bad choice. And then we have our very famous, the uh, water hemlock, okay? You may have heard of Socrates being poisoned with hemlock, okay? This one is actually a few years ago in Central Texas, some children, some young people were canoeing and they saw this plant and thought it was parsley and they ate it and they got very, very sick and I think one of them died. So very, very dangerous chemicals. So plants, because they can't run away, have developed really passive ways of protecting themselves and thereby winning the competitive game. Now water. <clears throat> water is sometimes a scarce resource and sometimes there's too much of it. So if there's not enough of it, you may want your roots to go way down deep, like these desert plants here. The roots can go way, way down to get any water available. So here's another example of how the roots have gone down, 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 and spread way out. So nobody else's roots have a space to grow. So they have won that little contest to get all the water. In other cases, you can have a special adaptation to allow you to grow in places other plants can't. So the bald cypress here can grow in the, in the bog, in the swamp, in the water. And, and the mangrove can even grow in brackish water or like along the edge of the ocean. So these plants are competing by being specialized, okay? They become specialists. And so, like the animals are competing for mates, okay, the plants are competing for pollinators. 
because by being pollinated, then they can make their seeds. They can also compete by being able to distribute their seeds more widely. And an example of wide distribution is the dandelion. We've all blown that dandelion's head, seed head, and those seeds fly far and wide. They've got these little helicopters on them. Okay, so you can have more seeds than anybody else and distribute them all over. Okay. Another way is to get animals to help you, like this blue jay down here, it's carrying an acorn and it's gonna probably go bury it. Okay, and then if you forget where it is, a tree can grow. So if you can get the animals to help you move around, that's another way to be a good competitor. And by helping getting animals to help you pollinate okay you can make more seeds okay so butterflies and the hummingbird they're helping that plant by pollinating it and that way it will survive okay? and one reason that, that today our planet is dominated by the flowering plants is partly because of this mutually beneficial relationship between plants and animals okay so the animals are getting food and the plants are getting pollinated and therefore they can make seeds Another really interesting example of how you can win a competition is to be very, very special, to be able to grow when nobody else can grow. And that way you get all the sun and space and water in that place. And in this case, it's a bog. Okay? So bogs are very nutrient poor environment. The nutrients have been leached out of the, out of the soil. And plants, some plants that grow there have become carnivorous. Okay? So they've developed ways to trap eat, and eat insects or dissolve insects that want to chew them up and swallow them. They dissolve them and get the nutrients. So here in Texas, we have these um, pitcher plants out in the big thicket and the sundew. Also, we have those. And then we don't have this one, the most famous one, the Venus flytrap. But that's a way of being a very specialized adaptation that allows you to live where other plants can't. And that way you get all the research. So you can probably do some observation of how plants are competing by going out into the garden or into the park. And you can see who can grow the tallest, which plants are winning that race in the forest path, what trees can grow taller, they grow faster and taller. And also, can, do they have any specialized adaptations? that help protect them from being eaten and therefore they win that competitive race of survival. Right? So everything on the, in the world, animal and plant, two things they want to do, survive and reproduce. And so they have to compete with other plants to do that. So if you have any questions, you can ask Dr. Gorman. One student says, explain uh, plants competing for resources. Under optimal, but particularly under non-optimal conditions, plants compete for resources, including nutrients, light, water, space, pollinators, and other. Competition occurs above and below ground. In response, poor habitats, competition is generally considered to be more pronounced than in resource-rich habitats. In other words, if we don't have much, I'm gonna get my share. If we have a whole lot, we'll share it. Okay, and now, Mr. Harry Monroe is going to introduce environment. A changing world. Uh, yesterday is not going to be the same as today. Although the changes are very slight, but it's not the same. But over time, we're going to see bigger changes. You know, some of those changes really affect our world simply because the environment is going to change. And there are several events that will cause our environment to change. We know that climate change is happening. We know that we have drought conditions that exist in certain parts of the world. We have hurricanes that are constantly plaguing, uh, plaguing coastal areas. We have uh, floods. We have what we've already been through, something called the Ice Age. We've had volcanic eruptions. We've had forest fires, and we're getting lots of those now. 
So those are all changes that are going to affect our environment. And to really help you get a basic understanding of how those changes affect life on our planet, I'm going to share a short PowerPoint with you. It's called Notes. So bear with me while I share my screen with you. Changes, a change is gonna come. You know, short-term changes, we have both short-term and long-term. A description of a short-term change would be an environmental change that occurs quickly and affects organisms immediately, maybe causing behavior adaptations. Some examples of short-term changes would be droughts, smog, flooding, volcanic eruptions, blizzards, pollution, and forest fires. In fact, we had a catastrophic event happen right here in North Texas when the polar vortex affected a lot of the plants that live here by putting our temperatures well below of what our average temperatures during the winter would be. In fact, my front yard has not recovered from it yet. I'll have to replace a lot of the shrubs that were once inhabiting my front yard. When we look at long-term changes, we're talking about environmental change that occurs slowly over time, affects organisms over generations, and possibly is going to cause physical changes in those organ, organisms' DNA. Some examples of long-term would be the ice age, deforestation, human activity when people knock down a forest to make room for developments, and we have so much of that going on, urbanization, Earth's orbits, the sun's intensity, global warming, radioactive waste, pollution, and extinction of species. Because our world is changing, students, the thing is, changing and evolving is almost like a natural process that happens on our planet. Because if you don't change with the changing world or evolve with it, eventually what happens? you eventually become endangered or extinct. Short-term effects, current organisms die, temporary relocation and behavioral changes. We see, we've seen that happen here at the postal, I mean the Dallas Environmental, STEM Environmental Education Center. We have two working ponds behind our center. And we've seen those ponds during uh, a drought condition, uh, seen those ponds go dry. And the aquatic organisms that live in those ponds, they cannot relocate. They end up being deceased, like we see this fish skeleton here. The fish have no way to relocate. Turtles, frogs, and other animals that can move, like the snakes that inhabit the area, they will move to another body of water. Now, looking at long-term effects, causes the organisms to adapt to a new environment. Permanent relocation. And eventually, if they don't relocate or they don't adapt or evolve, they become extinct through extinction. And then those that have to, have to adapt, their physical changes happens in that population, in that population's DNA, okay? Complex interactions and interdependence exist between humans and the ocean systems. And I won't go any further with this because the teacher that is following me is going to go over this with, briefly with you. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and get back to that and listen. Think about this. What would cause long-term extinction? Would it be a short-term or a long-term environmental change. I also want you to think about this. What can cause the genes of an entire population to change? Would that be short-term or would that be long-term? And what can recover from a change in a short time? Think of some of the things that I mentioned to you about changes that can happen 
are the events that will cause changes that will happen in our environment and link those to what I just mentioned to you. You guys have a good day. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Gorman. So if any of you have any questions, maybe he can answer those for you. You guys have a good day. Thank you very much, Mr. Monroe. And to Mr. Monroe, how to explain environmental change. Environmental change is the change or disturbance of the environment most often caused by human influences and natural ecological processes. Environmental changes include various factors such as natural disasters, human interferences, or animal interaction. Environmental change encompasses not only physical change, but also factors like an infestation of invasive species. And now Ms. Fuller is going to explain human dependence on ocean systems. Good afternoon, boys and girls. We're gonna talk about human dependence on the oceans. So let me share my screen with you and we will get started right on that. All right, so people are dependent upon what the ocean provides. Here are a couple of essential questions. Where do we get most of the oxygen that we breathe? And what would happen if the oxygen became too acidic, if the ocean became too acidic? So most of our oxygen that we breathe comes from the oceans. About between 50 and 80% of our oxygen comes from oceanic phytoplankton. Phyto means plant, plankton means drifter. These are things like drifting plants like seaweeds, algae, and bacteria. So here are some the pictures of these different organisms. The one over on the far right is a little organism. It's the smallest one that carries out photosynthesis. Of the 50 to 80% of the oxygen on our planet, this one, this one organism makes about 20% of that. So even though it is very, very tiny, microscopic, you might say, it is extremely valuable in that it provides the oxygen we need in order to carry out life processes. Sometimes people refer to the uh, tropical rainforest as the lungs of the world, but really it's the oceans that provide the most of the oxygen. The, uh, the rainforests provide about 20%. Now about 2% of the world's food is from the ocean, but it could provide uh, quite a bit more by using something called mariculture. Mare is from the Latin word mare or mare, which means the sea and you know what culture is. So by cultivating different fish in the sea, we could provide more protein to the people of the earth. The four different kinds of fish that I have up here on the picture, one is a shrimp, one's a tuna, then at the bottom we have a sardine, and everyone's favorite, and then salmon. These are uh, probably the top four fishes that, that people eat around the world. Now, what about transportation? The ocean has a tremendous amount of transportation opportunities. About 90% of the world's goods are transported by sea with 70% of that as containerized cargo. Look at the picture over on the right. You'll see a barge looking type thing covered in these huge containers and about 90, 70% of that 90%. Uh, this is how it's moved around the world. Now on the left, you have a picture of a bunch of people arriving at Ellis Island in New York City uh, in the early part of the 20th century. Prior to um, airplanes becoming um, more available for people to fly to the US or anywhere else, almost all transportation of people took place on the oceans. Now, trains are faster and um, uh, ocean travel was very long and unpleasant, but that's how they got here. 
Uh, and so it wasn't until after the 1930s, probably closer to the 1940s, that people began coming to the US in any numbers by air instead of by sea. Um, now we've got a problem called acidification and what is happening, the pH of the oceans are becoming much more acidic due to the absorption of carbon dioxide that we have put into the air by burning fossil fuels, uh, coal, natural gas, and oil. So what happens is the ocean absorbs this tremendous amount of carbon dioxide and it causes the pH of the ocean to fall, to become more acidic. As it becomes more acidic, it affects the life. Uh, very uh, tender sensitive ecosystems like coral reefs are really heavily impacted by this. Uh, our little Nemo friend, the clownfish, uh, he is affected by acidification because it confuses him and he has difficulty discerning where a, um, a predator is coming up. The shellfish that you see over on the left, they get their calcium from to form their shells from the seawater. If the seawater is highly acidic, their shells become more and more fragile and then eventually can fall apart. So that, that these are really uh, significantly uh, tragic uh, results of acidification. We are very dependent on the ocean for life, for food, for transportation, for many, many things, for beauty. Uh, a lot of us like to go to the ocean for our vacations because it's a very restful place to watch. It's very important that we not throw plastic things away, especially those rings, you need to cut those up because all of that business builds up in the ocean. We, we've got a horrible problem with uh, plastics in the ocean right now, and we're trying to come up with lots of different ways to pull the plastic out of the ocean, but the, one of the best ways is to not let it get in there in the first place. So try to limit the amount of plastic that you use in your life and make sure that you don't throw it on the streets so that it gets in the creeks, goes to the rivers, and then goes to the sea. Um, I hope you have a delightful day. If you have any questions about human uh, dependence on the ocean and the ocean ecosystems, Mr. Gorman will be more, Dr. Gorman will be more than happy to answer those questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Fuller. And yes, we do have a question. Explain human dependence on ocean systems. Now listen to these figures. More than 180 million people visit the ocean and the coast for recreational purposes each year. In fact, over 50% of people living on Earth live within 50 miles of the coast and the ocean. Now, you know, we live a long way from the ocean, so it really, those figures are really, uh, you know, kind of hard to, to digest. Uh, even if you don't live near the ocean, you are dependent on it. The Earth's ocean contains salt water, which cannot be used directly by humans for drinking and water and crops, but the Earth's oceans do indirectly provide all land life with fresh water through the water cycle. Thank you again, Ms. Fuller. And now Mr. Broughton is gonna introduce our guest speaker. Thank you, Dr. Gorman. Um, yes, we have uh, Mr. Deans um, with us this afternoon who is going to talk to us about a, a special um, system in Texas called Estuary Systems. And um, uh, Mr. Deans works at the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. Uh, they uh, help us um, study and take care of the air, land, and water here in Texas. So if you ever need to do any research on how to um, take care of our air, land, and water, uh, tceq.texas.gov is a great website to visit. Uh, you can learn all about how um, we take care of our air, land, and water here. And uh, now I'm going to let Mr. Deans tell you about estuary systems and why they are important. The Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, or TCEQ for short, 
is the state agency that protects the air, water, and land of Texas so that it's safe for the animals, plants, and people who live here. We work all across the state monitoring the beautiful natural resources in Texas to make sure they stay protected for years to come. Hi, I'm Robbie. I'm an aquatic scientist with the TCEQ. I'm on the surface water quality monitoring team. We call it SWCCM. My job is to help find out whether our surface waters in Texas, our rivers, lakes, and estuaries are healthy enough to support aquatic life and human uses. I work with collaborators across the state to characterize the conditions at over 1,800 sites. The data we collect can be used to identify trends and emerging problems with water quality and to test whether restoration programs are successfully improving conditions. You may not realize it, but the ocean is essential for all Texans, not just those living on the coast. Oceans are the largest carbon sinks in the world, which means that they store many of the emissions that humans produce each year. The ocean also provides a home for many of the unique plants and animals that live in and around our state. Humans are an important part of the ocean systems as well. Well, by fishing in the waters, boating, and visiting the many beaches along the Gulf of Mexico. The state of Texas has thousands of rivers and streams that crisscross the state, entering the Gulf of Mexico in seven major areas. We call these areas estuaries. Estuaries are unique areas of marine habitat where fresh water enters a body of salt water and the two mix together. They are home to many unique plants and animals that thrive in the shallow, salty waters of these estuaries. The estuaries of Texas can be impacted by both short-term and long-term environmental changes. These can be naturally occurring or they can be caused by humans. Some short-term impacts that are significant along the Texas coasts are hurricanes and chemical spills. Hurricanes can cause flooding, soil erosion, and can cause massive fish kills due to changes in salinity and dissolved oxygen. A long-term impact on estuary environments is plants that used to be limited to the extreme southern tip of Texas, like mangroves, beginning to creep into more northerly habitats. These mangroves may compete with marsh grasses for resources, which is why mangrove expansion is associated with loss of marsh grass cover. They can also alter the morphology of barrier islands, which permanently impacts the environments and the plants and animals that live there. In order to monitor the human and environmental impacts on our estuaries, the TCEQ monitors various environmental factors that show us how things are changing over time. One of the ways we monitor estuary health is through seagrass monitoring. Seagrass beds are essential for the health of the coastal regions of Texas. They serve as nurseries for larval fish and other animals, as well as trapping sediment in their root systems, preventing erosion and improving water clarity. TCEQ scientists on the SWCCM team work with other organizations to survey the seagrass beds and assess the amount of seagrass, what different types are present, and how healthy the root systems are, and then compare that data to past years to see if there were any gains or losses. These data can tell us what next steps need to be taken to make sure the estuary is healthy and doing its job in the overall marine ecosystem of Texas. While you may live far away from the coast, you're never too far away to make an impact. Some ways you can keep our ocean systems healthy for generations to come are keep litter from entering our waterways by disposing of your waste, especially pet waste, properly and picking up trash outside, especially near rivers and streams. Use less toxic cleaning products. And finally, teach your family and friends why it's important to care about our environment. I'd like to take a minute to thank uh, Robbie Deans and the Texas uh, Commission on Environmental Quality for um, sharing what they know about uh, estuaries. And now I'm going to turn things back over to Dr. Gorman so that if you have any questions about estuaries, um, he'll be able to answer those. I, I think you're muted, Dr. Gorman. Okay, thank you. And now we're going to, sh I'm going to share my screen. Uh, during this virtual field trip, students investigate how organisms and populations in an ecosystem depend on and may compete for biotic factors, explore how short and long-term environmental changes affect organisms and traits in subsequent populations and recognize human dependence on ocean systems. 
and explained how human activities such as runoff, artificial reefs, or use of resources have modified these systems. Animals compete for resources was, was uh, introduced by Ms. Ramirez. Ms. Nash told you about plants competing for resources. Mr. Monroe, environmental changes. And Ms. Fuller, human dependence on ocean systems and our guest speaker. Thank you, teachers, how did we do? If you would go to www.tiny.cc slash EEC feedback, fill out a short form and send it in to us. We would appreciate it. You guys have a great rest of the day, but more importantly, have a great rest of your life.